I'm very at home. I love this. It's beautiful. Um, I realise this is the last bit before the interval, and you're all sitting there dying for a beer, but you're going to have to sit through a little bit of science first. Um, I, as a marine biologist and uh, turned writer and broadcaster, I spend a lot of my time thinking about the state of the oceans. Um, we know more today than ever before about the man-made problems that the seas face. We also know more about um, the connections we're uncovering between the oceans and our lives and all the ways that we actually rely on the oceans, even though we live here on, on pretty dry land most of the time. Um, but the problem with the, the seas and ocean life is that for most people, most of the time, ocean life is out of sight and out of mind. Um, from our perspective, not much changes about the, the, the blue parts of our planet. Um, and, and I think that until we can really understand, know about, care, maybe even love more of the animals that live in the sea, um, I think the future of the oceans you know, isn't looking quite so rosy. But this evening I want to show you that we can fundamentally change the way that we think about things that live in the sea. Because we've done it before, and I believe that we can definitely do it again. So I'm going to start off by telling you a story about these animals, the whales. Um, because everyone loves whales, don't they? I mean, what's not to like about a whale? They're these big, beautiful, harmless, wonderful creatures that spend their lives cruising the oceans. Everyone loves whales. Well, the point is, it hasn't always been this way. Um, throughout history, um, the sort of the image crises that whales have been through have been many and varied. Um, in medieval times, the oceans were pretty much full of horrible, man-eating beasts, and whales, what little we knew of them, were definitely one of those. Um, and then, a couple of hundred years ago, people started looking at the whales, and they started thinking, oh, they're, they're really big. Now, we could make a lot of candles out of those. Because essentially, that's what whales became, was enormous candle factories floating around the oceans. We, we killed them, we extracted their blubber, we used that as whale oil, and that illuminated the human world for a very long time. Um, and we even did things like catch sperm whales, open their heads, scoop out the stuff that was inside, and make them into really good quality candles. Um, and that's when we thought the stuff inside their heads really was sperm. Um, it, it isn't sperm. Um, I love that you're not laughing. You think this is me being really scientific. It's true. <laughs> it, we thought it was sperm. Um, and we still made candles out of it. Um, we know it's not sperm now. It's actually something to do with their echolocation system that helps them uh, find giant squid in the dark, deep oceans. But we made uh, candles out of the stuff inside their heads. Um, even by the middle of the 19th century, when we got kerosene to pretty much replace whale oil, um, we found loads of other things to use whales for. They were really useful things. We made sexy underwear out of the bits that they grow in their mouths. Um, we, eat, we ate their meat. We spread sandwiches with margarine made out of whale stuff. Um, we even made anti-rust paints out of whales and bits of um, fluid to put in our engines and our cars until the 1970s were made with stuff that came from whales. But as the whales um, began to run out, public opinion did slowly start to shift. Um, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember <laughs> the, the Save the Whale campaigns from the 70s and the 80s. Um, but these were, I have to say, I think this was the single most successful ocean conservation campaign um, that there's ever been. Because within the matter of a couple of decades, we went from a state where it was generally pretty much accepted that whales were just something that we used. They were just a resource, it was fine to kill them, to being strictly protected everywhere in the world, pretty much. Um, and it was, thanks, you know, it was thanks to people like Greenpeace that in 1986 a global moratorium was introduced on commercial whaling, which meant that no one was allowed to legally catch whales anymore. There is a little bit of traditional whaling still that happens, and there's a thing called scientific whaling. And I'm not going to talk about that tonight because I haven't got time, but essentially whales are now a protected species. We think of them again as wildlife, not just as this wild, uh, as, as a resource. Now, I think there's a couple of reasons that help explain the success of this change in public opinion from, you know, from things we can use to things that we love and protect. Um, whaling was a really gory business. It was bloody, it wasn't very nice to look at, so the images were very powerful. Um, and by that point, we really didn't need 
to kill whales anymore. We had pretty much come up with solutions to all the other things that we use them for. But there was a discovery in 1967 that made the world fall in love with whales again. Um, and that was um, by two men, Roger Payne and Scott McVeigh, were the first people to record humpback whales singing on tape. They used Navy sonar, um, Navy um, hydrophones to, to pick up these songs. At first, they were really worried that this was going to actually be information used by the whalers to catch more whales. But it turned out that learning that these animals produce these beautiful, complex, wonderful songs um, made people just think that these were such wonderful creatures. Um, and in fact, um, it was people, they sold records of whale songs. It sounds really cheesy, but sitting at home listening to whales singing, I think really did a big, it was a big part of saving them. Um, so my question this evening is, um, if singing songs can save the whales, what about all the other fish in the sea and all the other, other creatures that live there? Um, uh, so my personal quest, basically, is to show that there's so much other awesome stuff going on in the oceans that um, there's definitely reason to pay some attention, be interested, show some respect, maybe even love them a little bit. Um, I don't want you to think um, that I'm being too anthropomorphic about this. This isn't about finding animals are like us. It's about celebrating the differences, because I think that's a much more powerful way of reconnecting ourselves um, to the natural world, because we live, we live such urban lives, mostly as, as a global population, that having ways to just to think more about the natural world is, is, is going to be really important. So I'm going to quickly go through a few of my favourite examples, and I unapologetically begin with seahorses. Um, yeah, I know. Um, so some of you, I bet, already know the really cool fact about seahorses, which is that um, it's the only animal we know of in the entire animal kingdom that it's the males that get pregnant and give birth. Um, that's not actually why I chose them and want to talk about them tonight, but I will just show you a quick video of that happening. It goes again. Isn't that incredible? That was a male seahorse. So this was taken by a lady. Oh, it's on the bottom behind the tail. A lady called Denise Tackett. Um, this, this is the Denise's pygmy seahorse. It was named after her. Um, and what I want to point out is what's going on now, which is the female comes back. The male's just given birth. She comes back to him. Um, and they basically start dancing together. I'll put that one back up so you can have a look. Um, seahorses dance. How cool is that? Um, <laughs> uh, they, uh, a lot of species have these um, very strong pair bonds and, and they'll, court, they'll undergo these courtship dances where they come together, they t curl their tails together, they swim around a blade of seagrass, um, their bodies will change colour. It's really quite beautiful, um, you know, to, to, to see. And it, it's, it's got a very pure function to it. The reason they're doing it is, is they're, they're forming these partnerships. Um, and even throughout the male's pregnancy, the female will come back every morning, because they live apart, but she comes back to dance with them the same way every morning to see, basically see how he's getting on, to the point where... I'm probably going to have to go through that again, aren't we? Um, uh, uh, he's just had the babies, and she knows that he's getting to that point, and she can be ready with the next batch of eggs so that they can keep making more babies um, as quickly as possible, which is what it's all about, really. So I give you uh, dancing seahorses. It's another awesome member of the, the ocean world. Um, the next creature I want to mention... Um, Seahorses stay put, which is all very well. Some of the other um, animals in the sea put on the most incredible long-distance journeys. Um, problem is, if you want to see a bluefin tuna, the best place to go is Tsujiki Market um, in Tokyo, because that's where most of them end up. They're a big business for, for the sushi trade. Um, but I, I'm sure that if more people really knew about or just had an idea of what kind of animals these are. They're not just a piece of meat on a plate. They are these incredible long-distance swimmers. I mean, talking about not necessarily liking things that are like humans, but these fish are warm-blooded. These aren't cold-blooded fish. They swim so fast, they raise their body temperatures. Um, but new technologies are opening up our understanding of, of the sort of lives these fish live. And recently, um, a single juvenile bluefin tuna, so not even a grown-up, was tagged um, off the coast of California. It swam across the northern Pacific um, 
to, to Japan, luckily it wasn't yet caught for the sushi trade, it swam all the way back to, to, to California. It actually sounds like sort of thing that Alistair got up to, similar sort of distance, 45,000 miles it swam in seven months, so a bit quicker, I guess, than you, but it, it's swimming. Um, <laughs> but um, incredible feats of endurance that these fish go undergo, and they're using the ocean in very predictable, very, very intelligent ways. They're not just drifting around. Um, Scientists are finding these enormous migration highways, not just tuna, but all sorts of species. Are like the Serengeti in Africa. They're using the oceans and, and finding places to spawn, places to feed. And it's all just, we're just learning so much about the wonderful things that are going on down beneath the waves. Um, I'm going to keep going because you're desperate for a beer, I'm sure. Um, my next species is, it isn't a swimmer, it's a drifter. This is um, Glaucus atlanticus. It's um, what's it called, the sea swallow. Um, I'm an incredible creature that belongs to something called the blue fleet. The wonderful biologist Alistair Hardy um, coined this term for the creatures that pretty much float around the top of the ocean. Um, they've evolved to be blue to camouflage themselves against the blue waves. Um, this is a type of sea slug. Um, it eats other blue um, creatures. This is a blue button. And this slightly uh, alarming creature is... Um, God, it's big. Uh, is a Portuguese man of war, which has a, it's, it's like a jellyfish, has a really nasty sting. Um, and the sea swallows feed on a Portuguese man of war, but they don't get stung. What they do is they, they, they manage to actually encapsulate the stings of the, jellyfish, of the Portuguese man of war, put it all the way through their body, and then use those stings. They push them to the end of these long finger-like projections and use the sting of their, of their prey. How awesome is that? It's the ultimate example of you are what you eat. You know, even... <laughs> It even picks the nastiest, most venomous um, uh, stings to use for itself. I just think that's genius. So not only do they colour themselves blue to hide, but they make themselves really very nasty to, to eat as well. So there you go. They just drift around the oceans. They don't use any energy. They're, they're a bit more laid back about things. Um, so I'm, my last two species are from a group that I think de most desperately, more than any of the others, need, need us to really get behind them, need public opinion to change about them. I mean, it's a long time since the movie Jaws came out, but I think sharks are still really suffering from, from us, you know, the general public, fearing them. There's 400 species of shark, and maybe only two um, can actually cause any real harm to human beings, but those are the ones that we think about and that we worry about. This one is a wonderful species. It's called the spiny dogfish. Um, it's also the spur dog or the mud shark. Um, I haven't seen one um, alive, but I suspect I might have accidentally eaten one, which, and, and probably a lot of you have as well, because they get sold in fish and chip shops as, as various other things. They don't call them shark. They call them rock salmon and give them other names because shark doesn't sound nice. Um, so they do, we do eat them a lot, which is, a, which is a great shame, and they aren't doing too well in the wild, especially because this one, this was... The photo was taken 200 metres beneath the water, and it's just cruising along. I mean, sharks are just such beautifully well-evolved, efficient, wonderful creatures to watch swimming. But then you find out things like, this female will be pregnant for two years. They have the longest gestation of any um, vertebrate that we know of, two whole years to, to raise her babies inside her. She then gives birth to about six live pups that then go and swim off. And we're, we're fishing these things and we're catching them. And this is the way that they replace themselves. But more than anything, I just think that's an incredible feat of motherhood. Two years pregnant. I mean, it's incredible. And, and they live down there beneath the waves. And, and we know, you know more and more about the lives of creatures like these. Another shark which, yes, this is a shark. This is my final species, my number five reason why you should love fish the same way you love whales. It's a full-grown shark, <laughs> and it's, it lives uh, down in the deep ocean in a place called the Twilight Zone, um, which <laughs> is basically where the sun just about begins to run out. Um, uh, and Julian already mentioned bioluminescence and firefly squid, which are incredible. Number six reason why you should definitely love other things that live in the ocean, um, as well as whales. Um, these sharks also glow. 10% of all the sharks we know of glow in the dark. Isn't that cool? They are bioluminescent. They live in this, this sort of very dark sort of twilight zone. And the reason they do it, um, one reason they do it, is to disappear. So the problem with living in this, this part of the ocean is if something's swimming up beneath you and looks up towards the surface of the sea, 
it can see this really dark shadow that you're making against the kind of slightly lighter blue of the water above you. So what they've, many, many species, and not just sharks, have evolved is a glowing belly. And they glow blue to match, exactly match the downwelling light, and they can adjust that light depending on where they are in the water column. It's incredible, and it means they disappear, which is just fantastic. But there's, just, there's one more thing that these animals use glowing for, uh, use their bioluminescence for. Um, the male uh, sharks have glowing genitals. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's just... And you can kind of guess why. It's dark. <laughs> it works. So, um, you know, there's, there's so much more that we still have to discover about the oceans. We really... You know, we think there's 20% that's still completely unexplored. Um, we, we found about 2 million species to date. There's probably more like at least 10 out there, so there's still a lot to go through. Um, but I, I basically think that if, if sharks with glowing genitals can't make you think differently about things that live in the sea, then I don't know what will. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>